there's a great connection between law and real estate and uh, they both need the other. I have like three or four guys come into my office and they go, Hey, we want to start a corporation and we want you to be our attorney. And I'm like, who is we, I mean, who, where do you see me in this role? Because I can put the paperwork together. I can represent the corporation. And if I do that, that means I give none of you guys advice or I can represent one of you. And I can tell that one of you, Hey, this is what you need to do to make sure you're protected, that you're looked after. But typically attorneys are going to be kind of careful about who they represent. I mean, to me, that's one of the fundamental principles of being an attorney is, is I have a client and I protect that client. Welcome to the Real Estate and Financial Independence Podcast. I'm your host, Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach, and this is a show all about helping you get out of the financial grind so you can do more of what matters. Whether you're a brand new listener or a longtime listener, I want to thank you for being back for another episode. The title of today's episode is The Truth About Using a Lawyer for Real Estate Investing. This is a conversation with my friend, Scott Toussaint. He has the unique position of being both an attorney who specializes in business and real estate investing. He's also a professor, uh, adjunct professor of law at Clemson University. I actually met him there. I go and speak to his real estate law class here and there and talk to college students about real estate investing and try to inspire them to do some of the stuff we talk about here on the podcast. But Scott is also a real estate investor. And so in this conversation, we kind of talk about both of those realms and where they cross over. You know, if you think about real estate investing, it is one piece, the sticks and bricks, the physical construction part of the building. It's one piece financing and the money, but it's also the legal side of it, the contracts, the deeds. And there's a lot of stuff that's kind of hard to understand if you're brand new to real estate investing, or even if you've been in it for a while, it can be intimidating about the legal side. So that is this conversation. You're going to get the perspective, both of his investing framework, how he invests in real estate. And then we talk about the legal side and the, the basics of real estate investing. What entity should you use? How should you use a lawyer on your team? This is a critical piece of your real estate investing journey is having an attorney there with you to help you out at different stages. But who should you get? What type of attorney should you get, particularly as a small and mighty real estate investor? So we're going to talk about that and more in this conversation. But before we get to this week's interview, it's time for my weekly behind the scenes segment where I share a short snippet of what's going on with me in my real estate investing, my finances or business behind the scenes. And appropriately enough for today's topic, I want to talk a little bit about my own experience using real estate attorneys. I want to go take a step back. My general philosophy on the roles of your team members in real estate investing is a lot like my experience in sports. I look at this like you are the quarterback or the point guard or whatever sport metaphor you want to use. You're the main star of your team but the team members around you are going to make you an all-star. That was actually a quote from John Wooden, who's one of my favorite old school basketball coaches from UCLA, won 10 championships. And I'm paraphrasing his quote, but he said, if you want to be a superstar in anything, it, the people around you make you that superstar. You need to have MVPs, quality players around you, and then you can be the star. So the context for that for real estate investing, if you want to buy good properties, if you want to avoid big mistakes, if you want to buy properties that have cash flow, if you want to build wealth, it all starts with the foundation of a good legal foundation because real estate exists and would not exist without contracts and without understanding of what real estate means. Like real estate itself, the word is a legal term for having an estate. So as a beginner investor, even somebody who understands business but hasn't really gotten into real estate, you're not going to be an expert overnight in real estate investing. So I have certainly not been an expert. I'm even today have a ton, of, ton to learn in this area. So I've always had a lawyer, an attorney, on my team. And there's a couple different roles that you need to think about, like how, how they fit into your team. One is if you're in a state where a lawyer does closing, so like in South Carolina where we are, the South Carolina Supreme Court determined that attorneys or lawyers, I'm using that interchangeable, um, they have to do closings. To practice law, to do closings is practicing law. So in our state, you have a closing attorney. There's specialists within the law, law firms who do lots and lots and lots of transactions. They're really good at doing title searches, evaluating title, handling the escrow, the money moving in and out. That is their role as a closing attorney. Now, there's a separate role. But sometimes there's some crossovers, particularly in smaller towns or smaller firms. You might also have a closing attorney who can handle like business transactions, like setting up your LLCs. They can handle evaluating contracts. They can handle just looking over negotiations with you to make sure you understand what you're getting into, zoning changes, things like that. Um, that is more of what I consider as a real estate specialist uh, attorney. And as you get up into the commercial world, you'll have real estate attorneys who specialize 
just in that. That really, if you were doing a creative financing transaction, using you making your own seller financing mortgage, things like that, that's the time you would have a real estate attorney help you out with that. And you might be, do it by the hour. You might just have them look over a contract with you. You might have them prepare an entire contract for you. But again, sometimes that's a separate role. Sometimes in a small town or a small firm, your closing attorney might be able to do both of those. And if you're in a state that doesn't have a real, required real estate attorneys for closings, then you might have a title company doing that. And your real estate attorney would just be there to help advise you and look things over. So that, that's the roles that on your team, so to speak, of your, you being an all-star is having both of those roles, one or the other, or both. And I had a recent experience where we're selling a, tra uh, a property. I can't give all the details yet. Hopefully later on, I'll be able to share more. But this is a larger transaction than normal for us. It's more of a commercial type transaction. And so I have had attorneys that I've used off and on over the years, but I wanted to have someone who specialized in this type of transaction. So I went through referrals. In this case, my brother's an attorney in Greenville. But if it had not been my brother, I would have talked to my other real estate investor friends, other people who own properties. I would have called friends of friends and just try to find people who's had a good experience with a local commercial real estate attorney, someone who handles transactions in real estate. And through that kind of connection, I was put in touch with somebody. We had an initial interview. Just talked to them to find out, am I comfortable with them? Tell me a little bit more about yourself. What's your knowledge? What's your background? What kind of transactions have you handled? How long have you been doing this? What's your strengths? What, uh, what, what do you do that sets you apart? Just the normal kind of questions you ask anybody, but then, and then I give them the specifics of the situation we're in to see their general advice. So that is how I met them. I felt very comfortable with them. And it's been a great experience so far of having somebody sitting co-pilot with me in a negotiation, in the contracts, looking things over. I can send an email to them. They charge by the hour or by the 15 minute increment. And it's just a important team member to have on your, to give you confidence that you understand or at least have a game plan for the legal side. So all that to be said, you can do the same thing. You should do the same thing. If you're nervous about something, if you have some questions about something, Get that real estate attorney on your team. They go along with your real estate agent, your property manager, your insurance agent. It's just one of those team members you gotta have. If you like these behind the scenes segments each week, I wanna invite you to stay in touch with me beyond the podcast by checking out one of the online courses that I offer. Online courses are a way to interact with me and let me help you with your real estate investing. Some courses are available anytime and others like my premier course, Real Estate Deal School, is more of a boot camp style course where you and other students go through live with me as I help you step by step to purchase your next investment property. You can get details on all of these courses at coachcarson.com forward slash courses. Now let's get started with today's interview. Hey, Scott, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Chad. Great to be here. This has been something we've kind of talked about off and on for a while. I've been coming to your classes and speaking to your law classes at Clemson University. So as a local friend, I'm like, we got to do this. We got to get you on the podcast and talk about real estate, talk about law, all, all the everything in between. So really appreciate you being here. Yeah, absolutely. I think it'll be great. You know, there's a there's a great connection between law and real estate and uh, they both need the other. So, yeah, this will be good. Absolutely. Well, I, I want to go back to some beginnings. We're going to get into some specifics and some fun parts of your story, but I'm just, you know, I was admiring on, in the background. I noticed some of the, your plaques and your experience in the military and you had a picture of an aircraft carrier. So I'd, I'd love just to maybe just go back in your professional career. How, how did you get started uh, getting into law? Cause you're a lawyer and you've, that was kind of your original, some of your original professional uh, path. Like talk to me about how that started out for you. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll go back a, a little further from college because, you know, a lot of times for college kids, it's kind of interesting because, you know, we've all been where they are. And when I was in college, I had no idea what I wanted to do. So, uh, you know, finally I ran into the ROC, ROTC uh, dude and he was like, hey, man, go in the Army. And I was like, well, I was going to be a, a, a computer science major. I was going to be an English major. I mean, a biology major. I ran through everything and I could read real well. So I finally picked sociology because I had to do something to get out of there. And I went in active duty infantry. I thought, well, if I'm going to be in the infantry, I might as well go all the way. So I went to airborne school. I went to ranger school and I was assigned to a light infantry uh, rifle division. And I was a rifle platoon leader, which was an awesome job. We spent a lot of time outside. And after about three years of that, I was like, you know, I've, I've you know, contributed to the, to the defense of my country. And now it's time for something new. And I got out and did sales because everybody knows that sales is important to business. And uh, I did that for three or four years and that was fun, but it got a little tedious. So I happened to be at a Christmas party and uh, I ran into an attorney and he goes, Hey, you ought to try law school. And I was like, well, Hey, that's something to do while I'm looking for something to do. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I applied to one law school and uh, which was USC in Columbia, uh, Columbia, South Carolina. 
and uh, and got accepted. So you know, I kind of walked into into law school. Didn't know a thing about law school. Uh, didn't know anything about classes. What you learned, I just knew you learned about the law. And that's what you had to do to become an attorney, and that's what we're going to do. Uh, so that was its own fun journey. Uh, so that's kind of how I got started in it. Was you know, I just kind of fell into it. Um, so yeah. Well, for the you know, I, I love I love how the the way you tell that story is almost like, oh, well, at, a, at a party, hey, let's, this is something good to do. And some people get so, I guess, heavy about decisions like that. And maybe I have too in my life. But at some point, you know, if you have, if people are listening to this and whether they're in college or whether they're later on in life, I'm having kind of a fork in the road. I mean, is there any advice on, you know, picking a path that now you've been doing for decades? Like, is that, yeah. you know, how can you take away some of the heaviness of that, that decision? It sounds like you just yeah. kind of said, let's just do this. Yeah. Well, you know, with a lot of uh, big decisions in life, uh, you just have to, you just have to jump. Uh, you know, when I was thinking about going to ranger school, that was probably one of the first big things that, that big decisions I ever confronted, you know, that's, uh, that's nine weeks of, of misery. I mean, you sleep two to three hours a night and you eat once to twice a day and, and you're moving the whole time. And, uh, only about 50% of the people who, you know, start it, you know, graduate. So it's kind of like, you know, when you face that decision of, do I want to go? It's kind of like who in their right mind would go. Uh, but you've just got to say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to do this and uh, you know, they can kill me or I'll make it through. And the decision with law school was kind of the same thing. Of course, it was a little bit easy after being in the, you know, part of the, you know, rapid deployment force unit. I mean, I knew in law school, they weren't going to kill me. Uh, they may throw me out, but you know, I would, I mean, I could do something else. Uh, but you've just got to say, you know, uh, you know, I'm going to swing for the fence. And a lot of times, especially with, you know, with my, my kids in my college class, you know, that's what I tell them. I'm like, man, don't settle for the little job now, go big and, uh, you know, and, and swing for it. And, you know, the worst that's going to happen is you'll miss and then you'll just swing again at something else. But, uh, if there's a dream that you have, or if there's a goal that's making you hesitate, that is really, uh, that's your, you know, your brain telling you, you got to do it, you know? So that's the way it was with Ranger School. It's like, man, this is a big, scary, you know, thing that there's a high possibility of failure. And, you know, so on one hand, you can get fixated on, man, I could really fail. On the other hand, you could just kick yourself in the butt and jump and uh, and see what happens because odds are you'll make it. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, they have that simultaneously have the excitement plus you're afraid of it. That's a sign. That's right. You, you, you get, you're going to regret this if you don't at least that's try right. it. Doesn't yeah. mean you're going to succeed. And, you know, and the professional life gets, it's not, it's not ranger school. Gosh, I can't imagine, you know, that's, that's a whole nother level, but you know, when you make a professional decision, you went to law school mm -hmm. and you said, you kind of went that path. What, what happened after law school? Cause a lot of people take law school and actually people don't realize this don't become a lawyer. They go do something else, but what, what, yeah. what, how did you pursue, decide to pursue that career after? Yeah. Well, one of the beauties of law school, I think, and is that it is so broad and it is such a great education that it does give you a lot of avenues when you come out of there. Uh, I've had friends who've graduated from law school who've gone into, you know, becoming an author, written books. Uh, they've worked at a law firm. And then they've become a CEO of a company they represent. Uh, like you say, some guys, I know guys who have, uh, you know, gone to law school and then they go, hey, you know what? Real estate investing is a better way to live. And uh, they've just completely made that, that jump. So, you know, it's one of the things I advise students when they think about law school, I'm like, you know, if you, if you go to law school, it does not mean you'll be an attorney. Uh, what it means is you'll have an incredibly broad skill set that will give you a lot of options in life. And it never hurts to, you know, have uh, in your conversation to say, yes, I'm an attorney, right? Uh, so anyway, so what I wanted to do was I knew I didn't want to work for a big firm. I didn't want to work 80 hours a week. I didn't want to sit in a cubicle, you know, for hours on end. So I want to be a, a small business practitioner. I want to have to be a sole practitioner, have my own firm and, uh, and see where that would go. So, you know, I got out and, and started that. And, uh, you know, that was one of those things where I just jumped. And at this time I jumped and fail, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I, I didn't make it. Uh, so I started, I started working with the guy and we had kind of an independent contractor arrangement, uh, but, you know, when you're coming right out of law school, it's like a lot of education that you get. You learn the theoretical, but you don't necessarily learn the practical. And uh, while I had done some practical training, uh, I wasn't where I needed to be. And I happened to get a ruptured appendix at the same time. I had no health insurance. It was a mess. It was a big mess. So, uh, you know, I got out of the hospital and, you know, got rid of that job and 
um, I went to work for a regular company for a little while and learned how to, how to practice law. And then I went and clerked for a judge. And, uh, and that was incredibly helpful because that really allows you to see uh, how the sausage is made, so to speak. Uh, and so between those two, after those two, I just started, uh, I started my own law firm in, in 2000. I figured a new millennium, what a great time <laughs> to take another jump. So, uh, so I did. And I started a little law firm in, in Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, it was a one person show and we did primarily litigation, a few little wheels and things like that, but uh, I enjoyed being in the courtroom. So that's kind of what I focused on. Uh, yeah. So entrepreneur, law, lawyers are entrepreneurs. They don't teach you that in law school, but you had to they start, you, you, you had to fall on your face a little bit. You had some hard step, setbacks, but you, you learned and, and kept moving. And, and so you, you started this practice and at what point did, did I'm going to bring this all back to real estate investing too, but w- at what point did you go back into J- JAG and the military? You were part of the, okay. the attorney corps. Cause I know that's a pretty interesting part of your story too. Yeah. Well, it was kind of interesting because right before L97, I started, uh, I joined the, the national guard and I was trying to get in as an infantry officer because that was my prior experience, but they were like, yeah, we don't have any slots for that. And I was like, and they were like, uh, well, what's your education? I was like, I've been to law school. I'm an attorney. They're like, well, we, we need some Jag guys. And I was like, okay, well I can do that too. And, uh, crazy as it sounds right after nine 11, I was in the, I was in the national guard and I just opened, I just moved to a new office. And we were actually moving in and we had a TV going, you know, in, in the office and 9-11 happened. So there I am unpacking boxes and 9-11 happens. Uh, so I was like, keep working. We're not going to let this slow us down. That's exactly what they want. So get to work. And uh, as it happened within a couple of weeks, I got a call that said, put your life into two duffel bags. We are, uh, we're going somewhere to play army. So, so I did, I had to close down my practice. I had just started and, uh, they said, you may be gone two years. Uh, so we had no idea where we were going, what we would be doing. It was just, you know, put your stuff in a bag and you got two weeks to close everything up because you're leaving. So, so that was really, uh, even though I'd done, you know, minor Jag stuff, this was a uh, big time Jag stuff now. Um, and, and the job that I had, I worked with, um, a missile defense unit. So basically what the unit would do was throw up a theater missile defense and a theater is like a, a large area that you're fighting in. Uh, like the, the Ukraine would be a theater at this point. Uh, so, and we were a command and control cell. So we had, we were uh, commanded by two and three star generals. Uh, and my job was to advise these guys on the rules of war, uh, the rules of engagement, uh, you know, any kind of administrative criminal matter, military matter, that kind of thing. Uh, so it was a pretty, uh, intense, luckily we were just gone for a year, uh, and came back. Uh, but yeah, so that was a bunch. And then I came back and started, uh, restarted my practice. Of course I had nothing to come back to. And, um, uh, when I came back, I was like, well, where am I going to, where am I going to have a practice? And I had a buddy who goes, Hey, I know a guy in Seneca, South Carolina, middle of nowhere. Uh, never thought I'd live in Seneca in my entire life. And, uh, he goes, there's a gap there. So I started, started working there. And, uh, kind of the interesting thing about my real estate is, and, and we haven't mentioned this is. I've been interested in real estate investing since I was in high school. I, I evaluated my first property when I was in high school, but my parents, they were a little conservative and they were like, you can't do that. And, uh, so I was like, okay. I mean, I was in high school. I had a you know a bunch of stuff going on, but, um, when I was in the active duty military, I actually flew from California where I was stationed to Philadelphia to hear a, a Robert Allen. I don't know if you remember Robert Allen oh, yeah. from the nineties. Yeah. Nothing down real estate, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, to one of his seminars, a week long seminar. Uh, so I'd always been interested and never had the opportunity, but when I moved to uh, Seneca, I had a place to live and, and that's where I made my first real estate investment. But, and just to bring this story full circle too, Seneca is a the small town next to Clemson or the most, both small towns, um, both in, in the Northwestern corner, beautiful upstate of South Carolina. So, so Scott and I live pretty close to one another and we're near the waterfalls and the foothills of the mountains. And uh, so we're, we're in the same part of the world and, I'm curious about, so really, this is so fascinating to hear your journey and the different paths you took and the forks in the road. And what was it about real estate investing that, uh, that kind of pulled at you? You said you were even interested in high school. Was it the physical nature of it? Was it just the entrepreneurship side of it? I'm just, there's all, everybody has a story about why they were drawn to it. Yeah. I think it was the entrepreneurship and the idea of owning an asset that made cash. I didn't really know the significance of that, but I thought that sounded pretty cool at the time, you know, as a, as a kid growing up, it's kind of like, man, I've got this house and, 
it just makes money. I just get a check from it. And uh, so it's kind of like almost, uh, you know, having a herd or an animal that produced cash, you know, an, an, an asset. I mean, that's what we would call it nowadays. But, you know, to me, it's like, man, this is pretty cool. I can uh, raise something, so to speak, take care of it, and uh, it'll make money for me. Uh, so I'd always wanted to do that. And uh, there was a book I read when I was a kid called The Good Earth by Pearl Buck. And uh, it was about China. And it was about a, a peasant in China. And, uh, you know, if this peasant was growing up, you know, she was a child and, and her father would tell her, and this is her, was that, you know, uh, it was basically that the, the earth is the only thing that we have. And if you own the earth or pieces of the earth, you know, that becomes, you can support yourself from that. And I was like, man, that is a crazy, incredible concept. And uh, so, you know, just that just kind of got ingrained in me. And for some reason, I, sounded like a good idea. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And, what, and for you, you were, you're in your practice, so you're already an entrepreneur, having to start learning how to pay the bills by doing your mm -hmm. law practice. Where, what was your first foray into actually owning property? Did you have, just have yeah. your own residence? Did you buy a rental property? How did you get started with that? Yeah. Well, the first thing I bought was a, a residence. So, uh, you know, I was looking for a place to stay and I bought a house and I didn't really like it. It was just a, a house I bought to, to buy one. And then uh, I had a real estate agent that uh, had, uh, had an office next door to mine. And she's like, Scott, I've got the perfect property for you. It's a foreclosure. Uh, you know, it's from an estate. You know, the, the poor fellow died and he left it to some heirs, uh, you know, some of his survivors. And they just didn't want it. They just let it go into foreclosure. So it's for sale. It's at a great price. There are people all after it. And you need to look at it. So I looked at it. And I was like, well, you know, I'm looking for a place. And it was a good price. And it was a it was a fixer upper. It had you know 1970 shag carpet in it, and uh, you know it was a you know an older gentleman who had lived there, so there was a lot of deferred maintenance and paint and you know that kind of stuff. But it was really livable, and for a you know a single guy, it was it was perfect. So that was my first step, and uh, and it's one thing you said that was interesting. You know from the beginning that I think is an important point is, is that you know yeah when you when you're when any position in life you know, you think you're, you're good at, you can always do business, right? So, you know, I'm an attorney, I know all about the law. Yeah, I can be a business guy. Or, uh, you know, how most people start a business, you know, somebody, you know, you bake a cake for the church uh, dinner, and they go, oh, you make the best cakes, you should go into business. But, you know, like I tell kids at school, it's like, no, 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 that's a completely different skill set. You know, if you're great at baking cakes, you should work at Ingalls, right? Baking cakes. But if you're going to be a business person, man, there's a whole skill set. It's like an iceberg you know, baking cakes or doing real estate investing or being an attorney, you know, that's just the tip. You've got this whole part under the water, which is payroll and taxes and insurance and business structures and, you know, all that kind of stuff that you've got to be able to do to keep the, the rest afloat. Um, so anyway, that was my first real estate uh, transaction was buying this house. Uh, and that kind of turns into a funny story, but we may get to that. So now let's, let's go with it. I mean, I, I, I like that. I want to get into that idea because this is part of what I wanted to dig in with you as an attorney. You know, the, you have one way of looking at the world when you're an attorney and my, my brother's an attorney too. So like we have these conversations a lot. Sometimes I'm the investor entrepreneur guy. He's the attorney. And we both kind of yeah. cross each other's worlds a little bit, but you know, you knew a lot about obviously about title, about contracts, about how you right. actually own this piece of real estate. And this was, this happened to be a residence for you, but what were some of the things that after the fact you surprised you a little bit about, or maybe you had to learn the hard way about owning real estate that maybe the law degree didn't teach you? Uh, well, that, that's great. You know, with this particular purchase, it was awesome. It was smooth. Everything worked out and, you know, I had a good idea. One thing that I did kind of learn about it, not because it affected me, but, uh, but because I thought it was kind of interesting was uh, the concept of restrictive covenants, right? So I bought this old house, old ranch house you know three bedroom two bath brick and uh you know it wasn't in a in a in a planned subdivision or a, you know had a homeowners association nothing like that so i was like man you could probably do anything you want to here but uh but but not because i guess even back in the day they were concerned about people raising farm animals in their backyards so part of their restrictive covenant said you couldn't raise chickens or ducks or cows or you know any kind of livestock and uh, you couldn't do auto mechanic work. Uh, you know, there were ser several restrictions that you couldn't have. And, you know, nowadays that becomes even more important when you think about things like VRBOs, you know, the vacation rentals or short-term rentals. A lot of people go, man, I can buy this house. I can turn it into a, you know, Airbnb it, but more and more neighborhoods have restrictive covenants, which keep that from, from happening. But the lesson I learned from this house was this. So I had this nice, awesome house. I was at a next to nothing mortgage. 
It was plenty of room. And then I got married. So when I got married, my wife was like, yeah, this house is awesome, but I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with a homeowner's association. And I said, what? You're crazy. Don't ever do that. Right. Because that's like having another level of government and uh, with all kinds of crazy ideas about what you can do with your house. So I said, we'll never move into one of those. So we moved into one of those. And, uh, and, and so the, you know, the whole reason we moved there is because, you know, that's, that's what we decided that was best in our best interest. So we didn't really look at the market, didn't really look at it as, as an investment, which was the mistake. And we moved in there during the height of the market. So what happens after we get there? We live there for a year or two, and then we decide that's not where we want to live after all. And I'm like, well, good. We're on the same page. So when we, we sold, because I didn't look at it or buy it like it was an, an investment, I bought it retail and not where I prefer to purchase wholesale. Uh, you know, when we got out, we didn't make any money on that house. In fact, I had to bring a, a, a check to closing, uh, which is, is painful. I mean, you never like to, you know, to give that away. So, and then where do you reckon we moved? right back into the house we had moved out of the, the little house, my first house, my little three bedroom, two bath ranch. Cause that's all we needed. It was perfect. Uh, and then we made a deal that we would never move again unless we had uh, a reason to move. So what I learned in that transaction was, was yeah, A, you make sure you have a reason to move and B, when you buy a house, regardless of what the purpose is, is you make sure you make a sound financial and business decision. Uh, because if you don't, if you just buy because it's the next great thing, or you think you need to be there, you know, things can happen in your life and they will to where, uh, you know, you end up on the short end of the stick. Such good lessons there. And there's relationship lessons, of course, and we all have our own, <laughs> our own dynamics in there that we, I don't think you and I are going to help anybody figure out. Maybe you can, I don't know that I will. <laughs> um, but, but from a real estate standpoint, let's, let's get into like what that business dynamic is. So, cause right now we're in 2022 people, one of the common questions I get is like, Hey, are we at the top of the market? Are we, you know, is this a bubble? And maybe it is, you know, who knows, like I don't right. have a crystal ball, right. but if somebody were, and let's just talk about residences because that is a, we all have to live somewhere, but what is a sound business decision with your investment, particularly early in your career from, from your standpoint, like, cause we'll get kind of get into investment philosophy here. Like what, what does yeah. it mean, mean to buy a property that is a good business decision over the long run for you and your family? Yeah. So when I look at, you know, I'm kind of a, a very nervous investor. Uh, when I bought, when I, when I, you know, the way I, I had my first investment property, it was actually across the street from this one. It was actually also another foreclosure. Um, they had had some marital issues and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it went bad. But, uh, you know, my, my concerns always, man, I'm going to buy this property and I'm going to have this big mortgage because you always hear that mortgages and notes are bad things. And, you know, you'll lose your property if you don't pay. And I was like, I'm going to buy this dang house and nobody's going to want to rent it. It'll just sit there and people will go, yeah, I don't want to live there. And then I'm stuck with two payments, you know, that I cannot make. Uh, I have to tell you, that was a myth because, you know, the whole time I've rented houses, that, that has never been an issue. Uh, so don't worry about that one. If, you know, that's a worry that someone may have out there, people will, will pay. And they will come and uh, that, that'll be the least of your worries. Um, so anyway, you know, I'm always very, uh, you know, cash conscious or cash aware when I buy. So I look for bargains and um, I'm very selective. You know, there are a few tools I use, like I always use the 1% rule to kind of look at it when I, when I get started. But I think uh, you have to take a step beyond that and actually uh, calculate your expenses. You know, if you're going to get a 30 year mortgage, well, how much is that going to cost? And you know, that air conditioner, how does it look? And you know, if it's kind of iffy and you never know, you know, when they're going to go, uh, how much is that going to take? And how am I going to pay for that? You know, do I have a credit card? Do I have a cash reserve? Uh, am I an air conditioner guy who can just fix it himself? I mean, you know, all these different things come into play, but I always want to make sure that I can cover those payments easily. Because to me, when the way you get in trouble in business, the way you get in trouble in real estate is when you get overextended, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's when you take that gamble and you go, uh, and we'll talk about contracts later, but same thing happens with contracts. When you go, man, if everything goes great, I will be a millionaire. Well, you know, how many times does that happen? Uh, not often. But what does happen is something we don't expect, like COVID or the Ukraine or, you know, who knows what's next. Yeah. So, uh, so I always, I always try and buy deeply discounted properties uh, that I can, you know, my, or I keep my expenses low and, you know, keep my income high. 
Yeah, I like that focus on cash flow. I mean, in a time like right now, when when prices are going up and you know appreciation is out, you know twenty percent per year, this is incredible. I mean, people are making a lot of money on that, but sometimes mm -hmm. you lose focus on the cash flow, and that gets mm -hmm. me worried as well. And and I've kind of found a more nuanced view. I'd love to hear your take on this too. That it's not cash flow is my first priority as well. Having enough cash in the bank making sure I can cover the payments, like you said, making sure there's a lot of buffer there between my payment and what I'm actually bringing in and rent after all of my expenses. Like those are such critical pieces that are just foundational. You can't run away from those. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there's a lot of wealth to be built holding a property for the next 10 to 15 years. I've made a lot more wealth on the appreciation mm -hmm. than I ever have on the cash flow. Mm -hmm. And yet the cash flow is the first, because that the cash flow is what gets you to the end of that to, to get that payoff. There's so many people I've, I've seen in 2008, nine and 10, I had friends and other investors go out of business because they had this big fancy real estate business that ran out of gas. You know, they didn't have any mm -hmm. gas for their car. So I'm, I'm agreeing with you. And then also saying that, you, that people have to, there's another big payoff at the end too. That's if right. They, if they use that cash flow approach, wherever they are, um, that's going to get them to the, to the payoff someday. That's right. Yeah. It's gotta be that balance. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting when you talk about investing in real estate, because I invest in, in single family homes usually, and I also have some, some mobile homes. And, you know, one of the things that people always point out is like, well, you know, you've got that trailer and uh, there's not gonna be much capital appreciation on that. I will tell you in this market, it's crazy. The, the capital appreciation of trailers though. I mean, it, it's incredible. It's almost like a gold mine, yeah. uh, but traditionally you don't have that. So, so the, your big benefit of mobile homes in the old days, at least was that cash flow. Where and so you would, you know, when you when you bought a, a mobile home, you're like, well, this thing's not going to go up in value. So, but I can get it really cheap and I can charge a fair amount for it and I'll make good cash flow. And that'll just be like my money machine. Where sometimes people look at like three bedroom, two bath bricks, you know, ranches, and they would just kind of go, you know, uh, this isn't going to be such a good deal. My mortgage is going to be a lot tighter. There's not going to be as much cash flow. But like you said, 10, 15 years from now, that capital appreciation will go up. And, uh, and we'll be in great shape. And, and I kind of like looking at a, at a combo of the two, but you know, to me, the, the cash flow is, is important because without that cash flow, you're not going to make it 10 or 15 years. I mean, the, the bank and the bank will be owning it. And then another investor will be owning it. Um, uh, so yeah, it's always, uh, it's always interesting to look at. And like I say, I'm just big on cash flow because it makes me sleep at night, sleep easier at night. Yeah. Well, if you don't mind, let's talk a little bit more about your kind of overall portfolio. You mentioned uh, mobile homes, you've had some houses and we're, and I'll just give a, a kind of context of the, the market we're in. We're in South Carolina, which in general is kind of a more balanced cash flow to price market. Mm -hmm. You know, some markets you have a, a house that you have to buy for 600,000 that rents for 2000 mm -hmm. bucks a month. We have, you know, retail properties that might cost 150 to 200 grand mm -hmm. that might rent for a thousand to 1200 bucks. And then you have kind of, if you go down the scale, you've got, you know, we both, we've talked about our, tra I have a few trailers as well. We have trailers that rent for 600 bucks, 800 bucks, somewhere in there and double wise, maybe a thousand, 1200 bucks. So what, what has, when you started, you started with that first property or two, like, what does that look like for you? Like, what was your strategy to buy other properties? And are you, were you trying to leave your job? Were you just trying to supplement it? Like what, what were you trying to accomplish with some of your purchases of real estate? Yeah. Yeah. I don't really know what I was trying to accomplish. I just thought it was a fun, a fun game to play. You know what <laughs> I mean? It's uh, you know, the, the first one I bought up, obviously I'd have somewhere to live. And then I thought, well, you know, this is a great first one. And once I got used to paying that mortgage, I was like, well, maybe I can pay another mortgage and, then this other one came up across the street and I ran the numbers and I thought, Hey, that seems like pretty good. And that's also a, a three bedroom, uh, a brick ranch. And I was like, yeah, we can fix that up. And, and to me, that's part of it is a lot of the houses I buy are in horrible shape. And, uh, and I like that because I like the challenge of going in and taking something that's a complete mess and being able to fix it up. Now, I don't know how to do a single bit of it. I mean, and, uh, nor do I have the time. But, you know, I like to see the guys go in and fix it. And we talk about putting, you know, hardwood floors in or putting in new countertops or, or whatever it may be. And, you know, this house goes for something that's just a total mess to, uh, you know, something that, that people pay good money to live in. Um, but the, my, those first two, my first, those were my first two and they were, they were brick ranches. And then I just, you know, looked for deals as they would come along. And uh, like I said, I always like good deals. So uh, I had a real estate agent and, and this kind of reflects South Carolina and, uh, you know, he had a, a house. He didn't even want to list. He was like embarrassed to list it. And, uh, it was a little two bedroom, one bath house for $13,000. 
And I went and looked at it and I was like, well, I mean, this isn't pretty, but it was, it was sound. It was, you know, fundamentally sound. So I was like, okay, I mean, that sounds like a good deal. And I was like, well, I wonder how much I can get for it. And I did research and it rented for 500 bucks at the time. So I was like, awesome. Oh, well, that sounds like a pretty good deal to me. Finally, you know, I need to make 1% of, you know, 15,000 and I'm making 500. Uh, I think that's, that's good. And can I afford a mortgage on, you know, 15,000? Well, yeah. I mean, at that price, I, I think I paid that off in cash. So, you know, that just became a, a money machine. And, you know, I think we had to do some plumbing on that house and, and that's it. It had a metal roof. It had, uh, you know, siding. And so it was, you know, pretty much bomb proof and it's, it's been rented consistently steadily since I've had it. And, uh, so that was probably my next. And, and then, uh, you know, I was always like mobile homes. I don't know if I want to do mobile homes cause you know, they're not really cool, but <laughs> I found, uh, you know, this, a, a realtor brought this deal to me. He goes, Hey, uh, this was one that was listed and, and I don't, you know, buy them off the, you know, the MLS or the market often, but it was a trailer that was a double wide four bedroom, two bath that was for sale for uh, 32,000. And it was currently rented at 750 bucks. And I was like, well, that's a turnkey deal already put together. And uh, so, you know, that turned, you know, I thought that was a good deal. Um, and then I, I looked at banks. I like looking to, you know, that was back in the day when we did have some foreclosures and I found this, uh, uh, a neighborhood basically with seven houses of the street. And uh, they were all two bedroom, one baths, and they had been uh, an investor on them and they were in horrible shape, horrible. And uh, so I was able to get those for, a, a, for next to nothing, practically. And we tore them down to the studs, you know, to the, the foundation and have rebuilt them. And, uh, you know, their rent's gone from 250 bucks to uh, $700 uh, and they stay rented. I mean, as we've been working on them and finish them up, we'll have people call. You go, hey, when's that house ready? Because I want to move in. When's that house going to be ready? And uh, so thankfully, those of I don't even put up rental signs because people will see it's vacant and they will somehow find my number and call me and go, you know, is that house ready to rent? And can mm -hmm. I rent that house? So, so yeah, so I have kind of a combination of things. And my, my latest thing is, a, is actually a mobile home park. And, uh, and it's just, uh, it's got one to start. It's got one lot rented and it's got, uh, one trailer that's in there that comes with it. So there'll be one, you know, one house with an occupant, you know, that can, that I can rent. Um, but I plan on just renting out the lots and the rest, because one thing you learned with real estate is, is if you want to make it more passive, it, there's got to be less, uh, moving pieces. So, you know, if you rent a house, you've got to worry about, you know, all the things the, you know, the landlord has to worry about, but if you rent a lot, all you have to do is make sure they can get water and electricity and it's all on them. Uh, you know, your insurance is a lot cheaper. Your taxes are a lot cheaper. Your maintenance is cheaper. Your turnover is less. So, uh, so yeah, so that's, uh, that's kind of what I'm looking at now. And I've actually got another one I'm looking at since you and I last talked. So nice. Uh, I love so, it. Yeah. You, to me, you just, you remind me of a, just a deal maker. You just, from the beginning, you know, you, you had that in, intrigue with like the money machine of real estate of you get these machines, you buy, you put money into them and they keep having this residual income over and over, mm -hmm. over again. And, and it's, it's kind of, I don't know if you play, have you played the cash flow game by Kiyosaki, the, the board game? Yeah, yeah, I haven't got it, but I own it. And uh... <laughs> <laughs> we got, we got to play that sometime. I, I play it with my kids. Yeah. I found it one, I found it one of the most educational and there's some yeah. faults of the game and the rich dad whole world, you know, there's some pluses mm -hmm. and minuses there, but what, what, what you it reminds me of when you start the game, you pull a card as a profession card. So you're going to be an attorney, you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be a janitor, you're going to be, you know, a teacher, a police person. And, you know, you, everyone, when you draw the attorney card, you're always like, yes, you know, that's because like, yeah, you're making pretty good money. And right. but then, but then not all attorneys do what you've done where you also on the side go and start this business and you use that revenue that you have from your regular business and that knowledge that you have mm -hmm. to buy these properties. And so you just accumulated, 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 and you, uh, you have options. You just, you have this, this wealth that you built. Now, so I guess it just, as you're telling me these stories, Scott, it just reminds, it reminds me of that game and the, <laughs> the, the, the path you take to start building that residual yeah. income. That's how you get out of the rat race. Yeah. And, and I think that's such an important, you know, lesson for, uh, for today, because, you know, a lot of times, one of the exercises I did, uh, you know, with my classes this semester was I had them go to our, our website and you can go and see what the starting salaries for last year's graduates were. So first I had them do that. 
And then we went to a income tax estimator. So you plug in your gross income into your income tax estimator and it takes out, you know, a big chunk of your paycheck. And they're like, what? And then I say, well, hey, don't stop there. Then we go to the IRS.gov. They've got a, you know, like an average expense for housing by region and, you know, then for food and uh, transportation and all that kind of stuff. You can so, say, hey, go there, you know, plug in where you think you're going to live and you got your salary and how much taxes are coming out and plug in housing and food and transportation and uh, see how much you got left at the end of the month. And, uh, you know, a lot of them are mightily offended. <laughs> they're, they're like, how are we going to make it? I'm like, well, this is why I talked to you guys about you've got to have more. You can't just rely on your salary. Uh, because one day you may get tired of working in the cube, right? You'll want uh, something a little different. And you certainly don't want to be, you know, working all the way through your life and you don't have the option of doing something different. So, you know, that's one of the, the things that always intrigues me is, is that doing something different, kind of leveraging activities to, uh, you know, to help provide your income, to help provide for your family, to give you some freedom, to do what matters in your life. So, uh, so you know, there's, there's so many different things out there. And, and in certain pockets, you know, this is a pretty big conversation, but uh, typically overall, I found in the college student pocket, it is not a big conversation. So it's something I try and, you know, make them look at and think about because, you know, there's, there's nothing better than going out to your mailbox and, you know, putting in a rent check and going, oh, well, this house is already paid for. This is like, you know, free money. Um, so, and you, you do that over and over. And, you know, I didn't really start investing until, I, until around, 2003 uh and it's 2021 now and i've bought a little over uh well probably about two houses a year and but you know that adds up and you know at some point i'm going to get tired of doing it and then i'll just be sitting back and to me one of the beauties is is you know i've got two kids well hopefully they'll learn lessons about this right hopefully they'll kind of that rich dad poor dad i've already had my 13 year old read it uh but, you know, that's something I tell them is like, look, we don't divide these up. We keep them together. We make you shareholders and, you know, you keep this together. You add to it as you go through life, you take out your dividends and, uh, and you grow up for your kids and then your kids. And then pretty soon we're putting everybody through college and, you know, then maybe we're doing other things and, you know, you're just kind of growing up, learning a different way, you know, to, to work and live. Yeah, it's financial legacy. And yeah. as someone as someone whose parents invested in real estate, I feel super fortunate that mm -hmm. I got to observe, you know, I used to complain about it as a 13 year old and a 12 year old, because my dad would take me over there and we'd pick up trash. And then he'd, he'd leave me and my brother there and say, all right, here's this foreclosure property at his fault. Go clean up this refrigerator. This got old meat <laughs> in it and stuff. And I mean, we were just, we just, oh, we're so, yeah, we're so unfortunate. P poor me. Right. And, yeah. Um, but, but the, <laughs> Like, but beyond the money, like I didn't, you know, there was no promises of money that it, it was just the idea that this is what your dad did. This is what your mom did. Mm -hmm. And it just mm -hmm. sort of infused my, you know, psyche. And it, over time I, I went back and looked at it as a career and I was like, you know what, this is what, what a, what a gift it was to see the behind the scenes of having yeah. investments and having a, a, a father and mother who worked, but also did this, uh, you know, mm -hmm. best thing. So I think you're, I think you're, that's, that's such an interesting perspective too, for me the, with the family and the playing the yeah. cash flow game with your kids and the letting yeah. them see the real cash flow game where you're buying these properties. Right. And this is, this is how, right. the good, the bad, and the ugly too. There's some ugly moments as well, but oh, yeah, there are this summer we were putting a vapor barrier under a house and, uh, and that was quite interesting. I mean, it's awesome to have my son there because he moves a lot quicker than I do, but uh, you know, he was like, what in the world are we doing? And I'm like, there you go, buddy. This is a, uh, this is what it takes. Uh, you got to yeah. do what you got to do. Yeah. Yeah. The, the checks don't always come out. You got to, you got to put vapor, <laughs> you got to put your vapor barriers down and you got to, right. you got to do this stuff sometimes. That's so, right. I love it. Well, I, I want to go back to the, the lawyer world and the attorney uh -huh. world and to yes. kind of put, cause you got one foot in one foot out and you, you have options now you could, can, you can, you do your career, you teach law, you, so you still have obviously fun with that. Um, I, I want to, for, for, for people who are getting into real estate, one of the big challenges I feel when they're assembling their team is l the law side of things. The real estate is pretty intimidating. Mm -hmm. I mean, from mm -hmm. the getting title to a property, what does that mean? How do I make sure I have good title? I'm about to borrow a bunch of money. What are these paper, those stack of paperwork mean that I'm signing right now to right. Earn, right. earn this money in contracts. And so without getting all those specifics right at the moment, I, I want to talk about just the, the lawyer real estate investor relationship. So you're, you're both. Right. Mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts just on for a new investor in particular, 
how they should approach having that relationship with a real estate lawyer? Yeah. Uh, have it. I mean, that's, you have to do it. You have to have a, a, a relationship with one to me, if you're going to be successful, because, you know, there's so much, there's so much stuff that goes in with law and with real estate in particular. I mean, that's a pretty sophisticated investment that, that, you know, is, is like that cake baker who makes great cakes. Uh, doesn't know anything about business. You know, when you, when you buy a house, it's more than buying a house and, you know, doing your analysis on the back of an envelope or the 1% rule or whatever it is and thinking, man, this is going to be awesome. I mean, you're making what's, you know, a lot of folks is their largest purchase they ever make. So, and there's a lot of law tied into it and, and law is not always intuitive. It's not always what you think that it would be. Uh, so you've got to meet this, this attorney. So what do I mean? You meet this attorney. Can't I use any attorney? And uh, I would tell you attorneys are like, uh, you know, anybody, right? Doctors or federal employees. You, you can't just go, oh, I need a doctor or I need a federal employee and they can do whatever from, you know, take your taxes to, you know, fight a foreign government or anything like that. You've got to find somebody who suits you. And by you, I don't mean you, you and your personality, although that is important. I'm talking about you and what you're trying to do. So if you're trying to invest in real estate, you need an attorney who is familiar with investing in real estate. Um, so where do you find these guys? To me, one of the best places to find them is by going to some kind of real estate investing association, right? Because there you typically meet people, all kinds of professionals who are tied into that industry. I mean, they're used to working with that industry. So they're going to be familiar with the issues that you have. Um, and, and when I think about real estate investors, I'm thinking about mom and pop investors. Now I'm thinking about like people like me, you just go out and buy some houses and, you know, maybe have some LLCs and, uh, but they're not, you know, in syndications and, you know, that kind of stuff. But as you get bigger, I mean, you can kind of grow into all kinds of different things, but you need an attorney who's going to sit down with you and, and talk to you about what every paragraph in this real estate contract means, because the one you don't understand is the one that'll end up kicking you in the butt. Right. Mm -hmm. And they need to explain to you, you know, about title and how title transfers and what does title actually mean and what is good title. Now you, the consumer won't have to figure out good title. An attorney will do that, but you need to understand why it's important. Um, I've had sometimes people who want to sell me a piece of property, basically with a, a bill of sale and a bill of sale. What that is, is a, a simple contract used to convey personal property, like a truck or, you know, a tractor or something like that. You just write in the back, you know, I sell you this tractor, you know, list the description for X amount of dollars and everybody signs it, dates it. And, you know, we're good. We've got a contract. We can't do that with real estate because real estate's a, a completely different animal. Um, so you go somewhere where you find a guy who, uh, who hopefully invests, or at least is familiar with investing and is familiar with the law. And, uh, and you start having conversations with these folks to meet them and see if you like them. You know, we have a, a upstate real estate investors association that meets in Greenville and there are attorneys who go to it and CPAs and insurance guys and contractors and property managers and other investors. And you can go there and meet all kinds of people involved in the industry. So if you don't like the attorneys there, you ask people there, well, who do you use for your attorney for this? And eventually you will find an attorney who is, uh, you know, real estate investor oriented, uh, which doesn't necessarily mean cheap. It just means that they're familiar right. with the issues that you're involved with. Right. And I think a that's a critical part. Yeah, absolutely. A couple of follow-up questions on that. So you, you almost like when you're re meeting a real estate agent, you're building your team, you're, you're trying to interview people who have more of an investor orientation. I heard you say that a couple of times that my experience has been in the, in the attorney world, there's all sorts of different business models. There's all sorts of different niches within the real the attorney mm -hmm. world. Um, so somebody who's investor oriented, that's one thing. <laughs> Do you, do you prefer personally to have, you know, there's attorneys who work for big corporations and they're like the, the ones who represent banks and they have all these big, you know, big, huge teams. You've got the small mom and pop kind of attorneys who, you know, who do a little bit of everything, you know, they can do some closings, some wills, they can do that. Like talk to me maybe just about the different type, yeah. you know, types of attorneys and maybe where a, a good fit might be for us as smaller investors. Yeah. You know, smaller investors, what I find is that, you know, a lot of times what we need is somebody who can create business structures for us, somebody who can explain to us the terms of a contract, maybe somebody who can review a contract to see if it's a good deal legally, right? Not maybe not financially, but legally, is this a good, a good deal? So with those guys, you know, you could go to a large firm, but typically, traditionally, you pay more to a large firm. And a lot of times they do things that are more sophisticated than this. So if you're going to start a corporation and you're going to issue different classes of stock and 
have syndications and agreements and that you may want to go to a larger attorney. If you're going to have an LLC, uh, and you're going to be a single member LLC, which means it's just yours or, or you're and your spouse, uh, you know, that's a, that's a good, you know, smaller attorney. Now there are places where you can go, where you can get attorneys that are larger scale, uh, but that scale down and offer a, a, a good deal, a good bargain. Um, so, you know, you can find it kind of wherever, you know, you need to go or wherever you may want to, you know, to look to find that, but you can get a lot of this information, <clears throat> excuse me, by going to a real estate investing group. But, you know, to me, it's really important as in, let me tell me how it, how it actually works. For example, the attorneys that do a lot of my real estate closings, because an attorney can't do their own closing. Uh, these guys, uh, they don't invest in real estate, right? They, they close real estate loans. So, you know, if you had an investing question for them, well, they could give you the, the straight down the middle law, you know, for that situation. It really wouldn't be investor nuanced. It really wouldn't be, hey, you may want to think about this. Uh, but it, also, if you wanted an LLC, you know, they could, they could do an LLC. But could they do an LLC or would they know to say, hey, if you're doing it for real estate, you may want to look at it this way. You know, they may not have the conversation with you about, for example, hey, you may only want to put one house per LLC so that that way you can protect your other real estate from loss if this LLC gets sued, for example, right? Yep. Because they're just thinking, yep, you're an LLC, I can do an LLC and we'll put all your stuff in an LLC and you're protected. Well, from a real estate investor standpoint, we may go, eh, you might want to look at that. Think about something differently. So I got two follow-up questions here. I want to, I want to in a second go to the LLCs and explain what that is and why why people might want to think about it. But the other, just kind of finish up the attorney question. You mentioned that in, in, like in South Carolina, we're in a state where, and every state's a little different, I under, my understanding, we have attorneys who handle closings. So like when you go buy a property, when you borrow money, you have this closing, this appointment where you're having the transaction happen. An attorney is by law, the one who, who handles that, that transaction. Other states have title companies. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's some difference there. But I guess my question is, it sounds like you, you want to have not necessarily just a closing attorney. The closing attorney could be play another role, but there's this role of this attorney advisor who preferably either has investments themselves or they have a lot of experience mm -hmm. with other investors. And they it's almost like they because they've been in your shoes as an investor, they understand what you need from a legal standpoint in the business of real estate investing. Because like you said, when you first started law, you didn't understand the business of real estate. Right. So right. Is, is that sounds like, is that, is that accurate? Like a closing attorney might is one team member, but maybe your real estate attorney is, is, could be a separate, separate yes. person. Yeah. You're in, so, you know, one, that's one of the things interesting about the law is, is, and one of the questions attorneys always have to ask themselves first, when a client comes in is who do I represent? Because we can only represent one party, right? because we have to avoid conflicts of interests and, you know, all kinds of different things. So when you look at a closing attorney, well, that guy doesn't really give independent advice to anybody. He represents the deal, right? His job is to make that deal come through. So as you as the buyer or the seller, he's never going to turn to you and go, Hey man, this isn't a good deal. You shouldn't do it. Or we really need to do this instead. That'll look after your best interest because he doesn't, he doesn't represent your best interest. He represents the deal's best interest. He wants the deal to close. That's his job. So you want an attorney who represents you. And this comes up a lot when people want to do partnerships or multiple members in an LLC or any kind of situation, you know, when, you know, I'll have like three or four guys come into my office and they'll go, Hey, we want to start a corporation and we want you to be our attorney. And I'm like, who is we, I mean, who, where do you see me in this role? Because I can put the paperwork together. I can represent the corporation. Right. And I can, and if I do that, that means I give none of you guys advice or I can represent one of you. And I can tell that one of you, hey, this is what you need to do to make sure you're protected, that you're looked after, right? And uh, all you other guys need to get your own attorney, if you so choose. And then maybe you have an attorney who also puts the deal together. But typically, attorneys are going to be kind of careful about who they represent. I mean, to me, that's one of the fundamental principles of being an attorney is, is I have a client and I protect that client. And I can't have two clients in the same deal that I protect, right? It's like representing a husband and wife in divorce. I can't tell the husband, hey, man, here's how you really screw her over. And then turn to her and go, hey, this is what you need to do to him. You know, you, you can't do that. So you have to pick one side and you stay with it. Well, that's what you really want because this closing attorney, you know, you may, you know, depending on who buys the house, you know, you could have the, the closing attorney can change all the time. What you want is that part of your team that you can go to and go, 
hey, I've got a question about this. What does this mean? Or what's the best way to do this? Or what are the different ways I should consider? They're not going to tell you what they, they think is the best way. You've got to make that decision and yep. they'll lay out the pros and the cons. Yeah, that's, I think it's really good advice. Ultimately, that closing attorney, you're, you're getting good title and they're warranting mm -hmm. that you're having good title and they have a title and company that's going to work with them to warrant that your title is good. But, but beyond that, that's not, that's not your expectation needs to be to have a that's right. think about it differently. So that's all right. So I think everybody's getting it here. You need an attorney, a real estate investor attorney on your team that you can look at your leases with, you can look at your purchase agreements with, that you can help you set up entities with. And this is somebody you're probably going to meet networking with other mm -hmm. investors. They're going to give yeah. you referrals. So that's, that's great tip. Number one, we, we got to go talk about LLCs a little bit, because this is another one of those. Yeah. Everybody asks this when you own real estate and this conversation can go also, you know, we can go much more in depth, but just the, the basics, you can own real estate in your own name, mm -hmm. uh, your, you and your spouse's name, mm -hmm. you can own real estate in some kind of entity. <clears throat> and so let, let's talk about the, uh, what, what are the pluses and minuses of either owning in right. your own name versus owning in some kind of entity, whatever that might be. Right. Well, the, the, the difference is you can own property in your own name. And for example, a lot of folks own their, their personal residence in their own name. Uh, when you get to have an investment property, it's, it's for an investment, it's a business, right? So if you own it in your own name, we have what we call unlimited liability, right? So we have unlimited liability for that property. If something goes wrong with that property, say you bought a poor property and somebody fell through the floor and got their legs cut off, right? Well, that would be a horrible lawsuit and they would sue and guess who the defendant would be the name on the other end. The person they would be coming to for money would be the owner of that house. And if your name, if it's your personal name on that house, they're coming to you. So it'll be poor old hurt plaintiff versus rich, cheap landlord, right? You directly. And what that means is, is that everything that you own in your name is on the table, right? So it's kind of like a bad game of poker because all of your chips are out and that's it. They can, they can take, you know, the, the damages they get, they can collect from your stuff. So what an LLC is, it's a limited liability company. It's a business structure. It's one of our newer business structures. And by newer, I guess it's like 20 years old or so. Um, but what it allows you to do is to create a separate legal entity. And when you think of separate legal entity, think of separate person who owns that property, right? So you create this entity, which you own, so you own the entity and the entity owns the house. Okay. So when you have this LLC, it gives you protection. So if somebody falls through the floor, then they look for who the owner of the house is. They go, aha, it's this LLC. They sue the LLC. Well, what does the LLC have? Well, that becomes the, the, the next question. I mean, when you're suing is, is what can I get? And typically there's insurance because remember it's a separate legal entity. And if you yourself would have insurance, You've got to make sure your separate legal entity has insurance too, right? Because you're, you've, you've basically created, I, I think of it as you create another person. So you have to keep that person healthy and business-like, right? Which means you can't take all the money out of the account to where they can't pay their bills, for example, or they don't pay their bills because as separate healthy people, that's what we do. And you have insurance to cover claims and losses as well. So you have your insurance and that's, uh, you know, that's typically always your first line of defense against anything, have insurance. Your second line of defense is I have this LLC because what that means is, is all they can take is what's in that LLC. So, and if an attorney tells you, Hey, put all 150 of your houses in one LLC. Well, all you need is one person to fall through the floor, right. And get hurt. And they can take whatever they need out of that one LLC. All 150 of your houses are at risk. So I know some attorneys say put one house per LLC because you're protecting that house and that house is more than just its value. It's that whole income stream, right? So if you lose a house, you're not, I'm, I'm not losing a $14,000 house. I'm losing $500 a month until I sell that house plus capital appreciation. But if I just have one house in there, the worst case scenario is I'm going to lose that one house. So a lot of times we look at LLCs as a way to protect our investment, protect our assets. So, you know, LLCs are incredibly easy to make. Uh, it's always good to have an attorney involved. You know, the easy part is, is making an LLC, creating an LLC, right? And putting your house in that the name of the LLC. Scott, um, Scott, I'm going to stop. Yeah. Can I, can I interrupt us that we're going to, I'm going to go yeah. back to, uh, 
the easy part is creating LLC. We had a big like uh, computer moment where it like started going in slow motion. I think the, the internet connection went down. So okay, I'm just gonna Mike. Mike, who's editing this, will come back and cut this part out. But um, let me. Okay. So let's go back to the, the creating the LLC is the easy part. You okay. remember where what your train of thought was at that yeah. point? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of times, you know, creating the LLC is, is the easy part. Uh, you know, it's like a one page form. You follow it with the secretary of state, you know, an attorney will do it or you can do it yourself. A lot of people think, hey, I'll use some online legal system to uh, create an LLC. And uh, to me, that's kind of like taking a scaffold and doing your own uh, heart surgery. Right. You've got a YouTube video and uh, you just kind of look carefully and it's, it's going gonna, gonna to work out. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, once again, law is not always intuitive or as simple as it looks. And there, there's some problems that can come up. Um, so, and, and I'll tell you, one of the ways to avoid liability, if you, if you create that LLC yourself, right, guess who's going to be liable when it's screwed up? Well, you are. Well, if you go to an attorney and he creates an LLC and it's screwed up, guess who's going to be liable? He is right. So you have his insurance covering you versus you, uh, you know, covering your own surgery. Yeah. So, uh, so that's something to always think about. But the, the second part of an LLC, and we have these in corporations, we have them in partnerships, and we have them in uh, corporations, partnerships, and LLCs, is they all have some kind of internal rules, right? And in LLCs, we have an operating agreement. And if you're a single member guy, it's like, like I'm, I'm a, all my LLCs are single member. I'm the only guy in there. I do everything. I'm the president. I'm the janitor. I do it all, which is fine as long as I do it all. Uh, so my agreement's pretty basic because it's just me, right? And I get along pretty well with myself most of the time. Uh, but where problems come up is when we have two or three people in LLCs or in partnerships and, you know, come in, dealing with the issues that can arise anytime you have more than one person working on a project. Uh, and, and we won't go into depth because that's, that's its own two-hour podcast about, about yeah. agreements. But that's something that, that you need to address and be aware of, and your investor-oriented attorney uh, can help with that. But we like LLCs because they give us great protection, and that's what we're after. You yeah. Worry okay. of, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I, just, I think that I'm sorry for interrupting there, but I think this is a this is a really good introduction to the con, to a concept that, like you said, has a lot more depth to it. This is why, and I just want to the point about hiring an attorney to do paperwork for you. This, this is like, this is where cheap investors, mm -hmm. you know, really shoot themselves in the foot because mm -hmm. yeah, I, you know, who knows what it's going to cost, but let's say it's a thousand or $2,000 LLC, you know, that, that kind of, if, if it's in that range for something that's going to give you a long-term benefit, if you decided that this is beneficial in the first place, spending a couple grand mm -hmm. to get years and years of benefit is, is a no brainer. Like that, that's the, that's the ROI, that's a return on investment. I mean, you, you buy properties for hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? I mean, why, right. why would, so I, I guess I'm just, I just want to emphasize that point. And, and also to say that like that this topic of asset protection and how you should hold stuff, it, it can also evolve over time. You know, I, I know mm -hmm. a lot of, Absolutely. I know personally, know a lot of investors who talk to their attorney and this is what you should do. Talk to your own personal attorney, but they look at the first two or three or four deals and say, you know what? We're going to look at this risk reward relationship with my attorney and me mm -hmm. owning it in my own name for these first three or four, because I can get great financing and because the financing company wants me to have it in my own name. And it's just a hassle to, and it's too complex to do all this other stuff. I'm just going to do it in my own name for the first three or four. Mm -hmm. That's very common. And people mm -hmm. have a lot of insurance. They have a good insurance agent. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that's why this is a bigger conversation. That's why you right. can't, you know, right. like there's some principles here and there's some things you should understand, like the, the separation of your, into your assets into multiple businesses. And right. that's, that's a great, great idea, right? Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Um, and right. grow, growing into this and having an advisor on your team who can look it over with you and help you figure it out. I mean, it's, it's an invaluable, just like you have a CPA for your taxes. Mm -hmm. This is a, this is a regular conversation with, with an advisor to help you get through it. And it's a good return on investment. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a good, it's mm -hmm. a thing that's going to help you over the long run. That's right. It is. It is. So, uh, yeah. So, you know, one thing that I always think of when I think of it now, now that I know what I know, when I think of people holding assets in their, in their, in their personal name, it just, it just makes a, a cold chill run down my spine because I, <laughs> I see the, uh, you know, the liability from that and insurance policies are good, but this kind of leads into another area where attorneys can be incredibly helpful is, uh, you know, when you think about how many times you've read your insurance policy and what it covers, because there are a lot of things that insurance policies don't cover. 
right? That you, that you, you could end up being responsible for. So, you know, to me, another person on this team is an insurance guy and an insurance guy who's going to sit down and say, Hey, let me, let me tell you, this policy covers, you know, this peril or this peril, but you know, you're not covered here. So you need to, you know, be careful about that. Like, for example, one of the, the big exemptions, a lot of times in a lot of States is, uh, is vicious dogs, right? So, uh, if you think, you know, when you, so when you think about when that tenant goes and, oh, I just have a little 50 pound lab pit bull mix, <laughs> right. That I want to put in your apartment. I mean, that should, uh, that should be like a red flag and you need to know if your insurance is going to cover it. And if your insurance doesn't cover it, well, what are you going to do? Uh, you know, the easy thing is maybe you don't rent or the other thing is, is this liability protection becomes that much more important. Uh, so if things go badly, you know, you've only got that one house on the table, not everything you own on the table. Um, yeah, the, the devil's in the details. And, you know, th this is one of those things that fortunately, you know, I'm not saying I'm perfect at it. And not, none of us are perfect, but I just, I've seen behind the scenes of a lot of investors being an educator. And I just noticed there's a, a lot of people who aren't paying attention to the details. Mm -hmm. I just, I know, and who, who reads their insurance contract other than your attorney mm -hmm. or other than the insurance right. agent? I mean, right. there's a lot of details in there that we don't understand your LLC, the actual mortgage agreements. I mean, that, that was one of the mm -hmm. openers for mm -hmm. me was actually reading my bank's mortgage documents and realizing how many gotchas they had and right. how many, how, right. how their, how their attorney had thrown in all these things that made it. So basically they could get that property back whenever they needed to in, right. in a, a great recession. Right. So anyway, it's, I think a bigger theme here that I'm getting from you, Scott, is that, you know, that when you get into real estate, there's some basics you got to learn. You got to learn the numbers. You got to learn that. Mm -hmm. But the legal contract side is mm -hmm. none of it myself included, none of us are really going to understand all the nuances and the details. You have to have a team sport here. You have to, you have to have a legal advisor. Otherwise you're going to be opening yourself to some of those details that you're, you're going to overlook. You're not going right. to, you know, nobody's good enough to pay attention and understand everything in this sport. Right. So that's why we have a quarterback of the team and we have a wide receiver that's and we right. have a you know, lineman. That's, that's really what an, a, 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 an attorney on your team, a CPA, mm -hmm a real estate agent, a contractor, like these are just all critical pieces, mm -hmm. but legal is, my, I mean, really the foundation of everything we're doing in real estate is yeah. based on the fact that we have a good title, that we have a, uh, you know, a contract that really says what it says it's going to do. I mean, it's right. a sort of, right. sort of a no brainer when you think about it. Yeah, it is. And, and, you know, hopefully your attorney will, will kind of, you know, appreciate the theory of preventative law, which is, you know, we do things to avoid lawsuits and we make sure we understand things to avoid lawsuits. And, you know, contracts are another one of those. If, uh, you know, anytime you draft a contract and it's, it's an equitable principle in law is you always have to look at who is drafting it because he who drafts, right. Drafts for a certain purpose. And typically that's to protect themselves, right? I draft a contract because I want to make sure it protects me. And if you draft one, you want to make sure it protects you. Well, when you look at real estate contracts, a lot of times who drafts those, a lot of times it's the real estate commission of that state and people kind of take those, those contracts and, you know, cobble them a little bit or, you know, make some changes and, uh, and who does it really benefit? And uh, a lot of times you'll find that it, it really doesn't benefit the, the purchaser or the seller. I mean, it's, it's not designed to that. It's designed to make that real estate deal go through smoothly. Hmm. And, uh, there are cases we talk about where, uh, you know, this guy, he was, he was buying a 95 uh, space mobile home park for $1.5 million. Well, guess who, who did that real estate contract for him, his real estate agent. Right. And he used the, the contract right off the website. Right. And uh, you know, typically in, in, in a lot of States, you know, all a real estate agent can do is fill in the blanks. You know, they can't draft clauses. I mean, that's, the practice of law. And if you're not an attorney and you draft clauses, it's the unauthorized practice of law, which can be a felony. Uh, so they're limited in what they can do. Well, anyway, this guy sued because he hadn't done his proper due diligence maybe and hadn't inspected the park and the water was bad and he couldn't make the payments. So, uh, so he sues and uh, it has some more legal theories in it, but really the, the one of the really big bases of this was in this contract, he didn't put in there what was important to him, which was the condition of the park. He didn't do his due diligence, but the contract said things in there that said, uh, I have a duty to inspect the, the park. Now, we all think that ourselves, but in, under the law, when you have a duty, it's not a, I have the option to do it. It's, I have the obligation to do it. And so the contract said that, that I, the purchaser, have the obligation. So now we're shifting the, the burden to him. And then it also said that uh, 
you know, the inspection has been waived or is satisfied, you know, by signing his contract, he's saying that's done. So we're over. It said that uh, he agreed he didn't rely on any statement made by the seller. Well, you can't sue for fraud if there's no right to rely. So he can't sue for that. So, you know, if he had an attorney, he could have said, you know, the attorney may have gone, whoa, man, whoa, whoa, whoa. This may be a great deal at 1.5 million, but let's look at what we're saying, because what you're saying here is when you buy that park, that park is exactly how you want it and you know how it is. And if that's what you're agreeing to, that's fine. But you better make sure that water works. <laughs> or, as it happened in this case, his case got thrown out of court. I mean, they were like, yeah, your yeah. real estate agent wrote this contract. You put all this language, all this language is in there. You can't come back and complain about things now. You agreed to all this other stuff. It's essentially like a foreign language translator is the way I'm thinking yes. of it too. It's like, that, you, that's if exactly I, it. If, I, if I'm going to go to Greece and I want to speak to someone who's Greek and, and I, or do a, read yeah. the menu, the menu in a restaurant, I got to have somebody who speaks Greek to help me out. And that's, that's basically yeah. what we're having here. We're having a translator who understands what your that's right. goals are. And then they do some preventative measures right. of communicating that with the other party. And in, in a simple case, that could be an hour consultation that could have that's solved right. a lot of that. It could that's have right. been that that attorney said, well, add this and this or strike that. And that's right. there you go, five, 400 bucks, you're, you're done, you know, but yeah, uh, it would have avoided a lot of heartache. So you'll see a lot of times with real estate contracts, people think because it's pre-printed, right? And it's, uh, you know, it looks all official, we well, can't change that. That's just how it is. And a lot of folks kind of, you know, this, you know, the, your agent, or you'll get the contract and you'll read it over and you'll kind of just glance over it and go, okay, well, that's the right property and it's the right price. And we've got the closing date, right. And, you know, maybe it's contingent upon finance and okay, that's all that's important in that contract or that I understand the contract. Well, there's, about, you know, typically about 10 other pages in there that are critically important. And that lawyer can help you go through them because, you know, I don't know about other States, but in South Carolina, if you sign a contract, it is deemed not only that you read it, but that you understood it. So, you know, when you go to court, you know, the, the judges and ask them go, Oh, well, you didn't understand that. You know, that makes sense. You know, the, the non intuitive thing is, is that, Oh, you read this and understood it. Like you were an attorney. So your attorney needs to tell you what the clause means and then the ramifications of this. Right. So, uh, so they can be incredibly helpful. And, and like you said, Chad, it takes maybe about an hour to go over it, but then you should have a really good understanding of what you're, what they want you to agree to. Yeah. And then you can decide whether you want to or not. Well, you sold me on it. Not, not that I wasn't sold in the first place, but <laughs> I, I'm hoping I'm hoping our listeners and our and our viewers will, will take that to heart. There's a lot to go in here. And, and one thing I want to ask our listeners as we wrap up here is that if you're watching on YouTube, if you're listening to the podcast, this is an idea I've planted with Scott and he's been kind enough to come on here that to maybe have some follow-up conversations and about other legal topics. This is a huge part of it. And I've kind of neglected it on the podcast, to be honest. I, and I want to, I want to go into it more, but I, I'd love to hear from all of you either in the comments on YouTube or just send me an email at podcast at coachcarson.com about what parts of your interaction with paperwork, with contracts, with LLCs that are the most cumbersome, or you're just confused about, or you would love us to have a conversation about. And if, if, if I can fit it into Scott's schedule, we'll have a follow-up conversation. And would, if, if you're willing to do that. And, and so I'd love to hear from all of you. Let me know podcast at coachcarson.com. And just leave, leave me a comment because this is something that we, we real estate investors need to understand. We need to understand the vocabulary. We need to understand what we don't know. You know, those, those parts of the, the business that we don't know so that we can then be more educated and have a good conversation with our attorney, with our advisors and, and, and ultimately make money, which is our goal here. But there's a, we got to understand that before we can do it. So Scott, I, I want to kind of a final question. I like to ask, uh, taking a big segue here, but go back from that, that conversation. Uh, this is a show about financial independence. Ultimately it's about helping people use real estate and, and the legal side of real estate as a tool to help them have more options in life, to have more mm -hmm. freedom in their life. And so if somebody's listening to this, they've heard a lot of the, you know, maybe we've scared them a little bit about, hey, these are the kind of things that can go wrong. But what, what would be some tips you would have? You've been on a journey here for many years now, of buying properties and accumulating. Just, I guess, any tips for people early in their journey about yeah. how uh, trying to achieve financial independence? What kind of advice would you give them? Yeah, there's a, there's a bunch. And, uh, you know, when we talk about it in class there, you know, there are a couple of spigots we look at. One is the spigot of your outflow and another is a spigot of your inflow, right? And if you want to make more money or if you want to have financial independence, you need more cash. And if you want to, to, to keep more of that cash, you close down your expenses. And uh, so to me, you've always got to be looking for ways to create assets. And uh, real estate is an awesome asset. It's an awesome inflation hedge. 
it, uh, you know, I've heard some real estate investors say, man, all we want to do is get a bunch of uh, properties because it's like ducks in a bathtub. And as the economy rises, the water goes up or well, the value of those assets go up. So, you know, it's all about acquiring these assets and, you know, there's different classes of assets, stocks and, you know, real estate and having your own small business. All those are great ways to make money and take tax advantages uh, or deductions, which give you advantages. Uh, so if I had to have one big rule, it would be learn the rules of the game, right? So the rules of the game are, if you don't want to pay taxes, it's not uh well, what you have to do is you have to learn the rules of the game, right? Just like monopoly or anything else that make it where you don't pay taxes. So with the students, for example, we did our, our income analyzer. Everybody's like, man, I can't believe I pay all these taxes. Is this right? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's right. I mean, this is it, baby. And uh, so then it's the, the question becomes, well, how do we, how do we get, you know, how do we cut those? And I was like, well, what about if you had a small business where you could deduct your cell phone, gas mileage, maybe cost of your car, piece of your house where you're living in? Would that be helpful? I'm like, yeah. Well, now you have to go learn those rules. Learn those rules so you can do that. Uh, so know the rules. Another thing is no value, K-N-O-W value. Because you want to you want to be able to buy assets, hopefully cheaper, and uh, that will appreciate in time. And a lot of times, time itself will do it. And then the probably the third thing is is time is an incredible asset multiplier. So if you buy an asset today and you hold it for twenty years, or if you invest regularly, right, dollar cost averaging if it's stocks or houses if it's uh, real estate, uh, you know, over time that will the the end product will be much greater than the sum of the parts. And if a lot of people go, well, I don't have money to invest in, and I want to invest in real estate. I want to get those returns, but I can't afford a house. And I'm like, well, you know, what I always tell students is, okay, well, this is great because you don't have to buy a house. And if you want to buy a business, what's the easiest way to buy a business? Well, you buy stock. So if you want to buy a house, but you can't afford a whole house, what do you buy? Well, maybe you look at REITs. Maybe you look at Fundrise. You look at these alternatives that fit your, your budget and your income, and you just work on growing your way up until eventually you can afford a house and, and maybe a you know, hundred unit apartment building and, you know, whatever your, whatever your goals are, uh, but you got to start. I mean, that's the, mm -hmm. that's the key. Uh, and education, you know, helps with that learning your different options and going uh, to these things, these meetings, you know, investment meetings and all that kind of stuff. You learn uh, all kinds of great stuff. Well, as a fellow teacher, I think we both agree that this is a, it's as crazy as things seem as, you know, the world's craziness happening in the world. This is a, an amazing time. Mm -hmm. If you want, if you want to invest for yourself, if you want to build more freedom, there's so many options to buy those assets you're talking about, mm -hmm. but it does require knowledge. And so if somebody's sure. listening to this, you know, they're, we just got to give kudos to the people listening to this because you're, you're learning, you're, mm -hmm. you're educating yourselves. And Scott and I both are believers. And that if you, if you learn what you're trying to accomplish, if you learn some of the rules of that game, then you can win it. This is a, this is an amazing fertile econ economy that we live in mm -hmm. and, Still today, there's tons and tons and tons of options, even with real estate prices high, there's all sorts of opportunities out there. So just appreciate your optimistic message, Scott, and leading us through some of these, uh, these kind of quagmires that people get into about how do you deal with lawyers and how do you do that? So we'll have a follow-up conversation on some other topics and just appreciate you sharing your journey with us. Hey, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Okay. Good luck to everybody out there. All right. Thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. I hope you enjoyed this interview about using an attorney with real estate investing. If you like this episode, I hope you'll join me again next week as I interview not an attorney, but a doctor, my friend, Dr. Jordan Grummet, who has a new book coming out called Taking Stock, a Hospice Doctor's Advice on Financial Independence, Building Wealth, and Living a Regret-Free Life. He's also known as Doc G. He has a very popular podcast that I refer a lot of people to. And we're going to talk about real estate investing, of course, about finance but about how this relates to your life and not getting to the end of your life where you're regretting the things you didn't do. Because after all, the show is all about doing what matters. So just going to be a great conversation. I hope you'll join me next week. If you like the show, I'd like to invite you to subscribe to my free email newsletter at coachcarson.com forward slash REI toolkit. In addition to weekly updates, articles, and behind the scenes tips from me, my email newsletter subscribers get my real estate investing toolkit, which includes a property closing checklist that I actually use when I buy properties, a real estate deal worksheet, a tenant screening criteria checklist, and other spreadsheets and goodies that will help you on your journey to financial independence using real estate. You can get it all for free at coachcarson.com forward slash REI toolkit. I also want to take this time to thank some people behind the scenes who make this podcast possible each and every week. This includes my podcast editor extraordinaire, Michael Wynn, my amazing virtual assistant, Megan Thompson, my wife, Carrie, who helps me behind the scenes and is my partner here at Coach Carson. 
And of course, thank you to all of you, the listeners of this show who make everything possible. This show exists for you. It exists because of you. And I really appreciate you being here for another episode. Everything I've shared with you in this episode has been for general education purposes. I have not considered your specific situation or risks. Before buying your own investments, be sure to consult a financial, real estate, and or a legal professional. Until next time, I'm Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach. And this is a show all about helping you get out of the financial grind so you can do more of what matters. See you next time.